the sweet joy of being a Roman legionary, where a day's work could mean building fortresses or facing brutal punishment. It was a formidable force, not just because of its tactical prowess or superior equipment, but also due to its unyielding discipline. This discipline, however, came at a steep human cost. Decimation was one of the most feared punishments. When decimation was ordered, soldiers were divided into groups of ten, each drew lots, and the unlucky one, marked by fate, was beaten or stoned to death by his nine comrades. But let's not gloss over the details. An officer may order decimation when a unit was deemed cowardly or ineffective. It wasn't just a punishment, it was a psychological weapon, instilling a palpable fear not just of the enemy, but of one's own brothers in arms, men who lived, fought, ate, bled and wept together practically family by the end of their military careers. Now, imagine standing next to your fellow soldier, not knowing if you'll be his executioner or his victim. Flogging, while less fatal, was no less brutal. The whip, often tipped with metal or bone, wasn't just a tool of pain, but also of absolute authority. Many a soldier feared the lash more than the enemy, the reasons for flogging varied, from insubordination to dereliction of duty. But the message was always clear. Step out of line and suffer immensely. The scars borne by the soldiers were not just physical, they were psychological too, cementing the tenets of Roman military law in their minds. But Roman discipline wasn't all about high drama. Sometimes it was the petty, mundane punishments that ground down the spirit. Being assigned to menial tasks, like digging latrines or cleaning the camp, might sound trivial, but in a culture that prized martial prowess and honor, these tasks were a mark of shame, a public display of a soldier's fall from grace, akin to a renowned artist being reduced to painting fences. Historical records are filled with examples of these practices. There's the story of a centurion known as Cedo Alteram, bring me another, notorious for breaking his vine staff, a symbol of his authority, on the backs of his soldiers, only to call for another to continue the punishment. It's a vivid illustration of the sometimes sadistic nature of Roman discipline. The impact of these punishments on morale and discipline was profound. On one hand, they ensured order and obedience, the bedrock of Roman military success. On the other, they fostered a culture of fear and resentment. Soldiers often obeyed not out of loyalty or courage, but out of sheer terror of the consequences of disobedience. In the harsh world of a Roman legionary, the glamour of battle was often overshadowed by the struggle for adequate compensation. Their lives, a constant juggle between duty and survival, hinged on the meagre salary they received, often paid in salt, a commodity as essential as it was symbolic in ancient Rome. This is also the origin of the word salary today. First off, the legionary salary. It's easy to romanticize the life of a Roman soldier, but let's face it, their pay was modest at best. Talking a stipend that barely covered the basics, and when I say basics, I mean just enough to keep you from deserting. Now, about that salt, it wasn't just a seasoning, it was a symbol of wealth. It was a symbol of wealth and an essential commodity. In a world without refrigerators, Salt was the go-to for preserving food. So, getting paid in salt wasn't just practical, it was vital. Legionnaires would then trade their salary for goods and services necessary to legionary life. Imagine a marketplace buzzing with soldiers, bartering their hard-earned salt for a decent meal or new sandals, and you would then have a fairly good idea of what it would look like with soldiers on leave trading for essential goods. 
The spoils of war were the real deal, though. This was where a legionary could strike it rich or die trying. Imagine, you've survived a brutal battle, and there before you lies the treasure of a conquered land. Gold, jewels, exotic goods, the stuff of dreams. Take just enough, and you could substantially improve your standard of living. Take too much, and you could both invite unwanted attention and find yourself weighed down in an ambush, having to carry your loot on the march. Comparing this to modern military compensation is quite the contrast. Today, soldiers sign up and get a package deal, salary, benefits, and sometimes a retirement plan. Personal stories of legionaries, found by archaeologists, bring this all to life. There's a soldier by the name of Lucius, who scrimped and saved every grain of salt to buy a small farm. There's another named Decimus, who gambled his spoils on a game of dice and lost it all. These stories paint a varied picture of the legionary life, a mix of ambition, risk, and the harsh reality of being a cog in the Roman war machine. Embarking on a 25-year service, the life of a Roman legionary was a vivid illustration of extraordinary endurance and resilience. This quarter-century commitment transcended the notion of a mere job. From the very beginning, their marching capabilities set them apart. Legionaries were expected to cover distances up to 20 miles daily, all while carrying around 60 pounds of armor, weapons, and supplies. This wasn't just an occasional challenge, but a daily norm for which they needed exceptional physical conditioning and unwavering discipline. Their diet, essential for maintaining such endurance, was basic yet functional. The legionaries' primary sustenance was wheat, often turned into a simple porridge or bread. Meat, a luxury, was typically part of their rations during campaigns. Garum, a fermented fish sauce, was a staple condiment, adding much needed protein and salt to their otherwise bland meals. Beyond the battlefield, a legionary was filled with demanding duties. Each evening, after hours of marching, they engaged in constructing fortified camps. These structures, complete with ditches and ramparts, required significant manual labor. Additionally, maintaining their equipment was crucial. Their armor and weapons were vital for survival, necessitating meticulous care. The physical and mental toll of such a lifestyle was immense. The constant physical exertion, coupled with the psychological strains of warfare and strict military discipline, made the legionary life exceptionally challenging. This often led to lifelong joint problems, particularly in the knees, we suspect. Despite these hardships, they persevered, driven by a deep-rooted sense of duty and the strong bonds formed with fellow believers. Personal accounts from ancient texts offer a glimpse into their experiences. Letters and inscriptions reveal a mix of emotions, homesickness, pride in their service, and a deep sense of camaraderie were all commonplace. The Roman legionaries didn't just face the rigors of their own demanding lifestyle, however. They also clashed with a roster of formidable enemies, each bringing their own brand of nightmare to the battlefield. One notorious example was the Thracians, with their phallux. They weren't just another enemy, they were a brutal wake-up call for Rome. The phallux was a curved blade, reminiscent of a farmer's scythe, but engineered for war, and it could reach around a Roman shield and inflict grievous wounds. This is if the wielder didn't simply attempt to puncture the helmet with a downward strike, often succeeding. The Romans, always pragmatic, responded not with panic but with innovation. They reinforced their helmets, the sagittae, with extra metal bands and cheek guards, transforming them into formidable pieces of defensive gear. 
This adaptation was a direct response to the phallux, one of the few times that a new weapon alone was reason to change their armor design. Moving east, the Parthian cataphracts presented a different kind of nightmare. These were not just cavalrymen, they were armed and armored to the teeth, both horse and rider, turning them into the equivalent of a human tank. The Romans, accustomed to fighting less well-protected foes, found their traditional tactics and equipment ineffective. The cataphract's heavy armor rendered the Roman javelins, the pilum, almost useless. This led to a significant shift in Roman battle strategy, emphasizing the need for mobility and the use of auxiliary troops equipped with more effective weapons against such heavily armored adversaries. The Jewish zealots during the siege of Jerusalem presented a different challenge altogether. Their fanatical resistance and guerrilla tactics in the urban environment of Jerusalem were a far cry from the open field battles the Romans excelled in. The Romans had to adapt to urban warfare, which was messy, unpredictable, and required a level of flexibility that was not typically Roman. They had to learn to fight in narrow streets and alleys, breach fortified walls, and engage in combat strangely familiar to the region today. If you think we've missed anything or want to provide further insight, we invite you to comment below. Aside from that, feel free to watch more of our videos.